Nation's Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything, geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redman. Okay, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I am your host, Pierce Redman, and you can find the show here at American Freedom Radio, AmericanFreedomRadio.com, as well as on my website, which is PorkinsPolicyReview.com. And you can always listen uh, to the show on uh, iTunes, on YouTube. You can subscribe through RSS. Uh, and, of course, you can hear the show rebroadcast later on in the week on Friday nights, uh, from 11 to 1 a.m., I believe. I should get the, the time uh, straight, but uh, yeah, it's usually 11 to 1 a.m. Um, lots to get into with today's episode. So quickly, I just want to thank Peter for a very generous donation on PayPal. Thank you so much. And of course, you can always subscribe to my, sh- uh, you can become a subscriber on Patreon. You can also give a donation on PayPal. And uh, if the uh, you know, you got your checkbook out or your wallet and you want to uh, throw a little bit of money, become a subscriber to American Freedom Radio. That, of course, helps out a lot. So please do that as well. But today we are welcoming back Pat McKenna, legendary private investigator, of course, involved with the O.J. Simpson case. And uh, we've got Pat back on to uh, discuss more about O.J. We had a tremendous uh, response uh, to uh, the, the Pat's uh, last appearance on the show. So, Pat McKenna, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Excellent, excellent. Like I said, um, we had a really just tremendous response. People really seem to uh, enjoy uh, listening uh, to our previous conversation. And uh, I did actually get quite a few uh, listener questions, and I even have some of my own questions, and uh, perhaps, um, well, hopefully we'll, we'll get to that, but I have a feeling okay. uh, we might have to, to save that for another show, because uh, I, I really do want to talk to you today, Pat, about the timelines of the murder, and this is uh, one of the, uh, it's a topic that I, I have uh, explored on previous episodes where we, we've been talking about this, but this is a, the timeline is obviously in any murder investigation is extremely important. Uh, but in the OJ case, it, it is one of the aspects that is sort of overlooked or it is filled with so many excuses, uh, on behalf of the prosecution and on behalf of the people that are, you know, 100% convinced that OJ is guilty. Uh, when you bring up issues in the timeline, uh, they're sort of at a loss for words. And I, I find that uh, while people will point to all sorts of little – some, you know, bits and pieces of evidence or things that they've heard like the Bruno Magley shoes or this and that and the other thing, uh, a lot of them kind of fall, some of them based somewhat in reality. Uh, but they'll point uh-huh. to those as to, oh, well, this is why he's guilty. You know, we know he's guilty. But sure. when you uh, present them with a timeline – And you start breaking down, well, he only had, you know, five minutes to do this and to do that. Uh, Suddenly you present them with uh, a a lot of information and they don't really have a a good uh, response to this. Um, And, uh, Pat, maybe we can we can start first with the prosecution's timeline, which is full of problems. Uh, It kept changing even during the trial. And it was a very tight, 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 tight excuse me, tight timeline uh, with very little wiggle room for O.J. to have committed um, these murders and then clean himself up and then get in the car. And essentially we have the prosecution's timeline starting with Pablo Fenez hearing the now infamous plaintive wail at 10.15. So this is when O.J., I guess, begins the murders. Uh, and then, of course, the, uh, he, in that time period, he then has to be, um, back at his house at 1040 to knock on Cato Kalen's air conditioner three times. And right. so that's only about 25 minutes. 
Uh, and then, of course, he, Alan Park sees OJ, um, at 10.55, and then by 11, he's in the limousine going home, uh, going, uh, rather to LAX, uh, to, to, uh, to Chicago. But, um, Pat, briefly, um, flesh out a little bit, uh, anything I might have missed there in terms of the prosecution's timeline, and then let's get into, uh, what actually transpired. But, uh, you know, explain a little bit to the listeners the prosecution's timeline and, and the major problems with it. Okay. Well, the plaintiff whale of a dog, that phrase, was uh, given to us by the one Pablo Fenya, who in the preliminary hearing early in the case, remember, it's, I think in early July of 94, they put an array of people together that we're out walking dogs, or uh, that I remember mm. the guy Schwab, I think his name was, that really enjoyed his role on TV, and he saw Mary Tyler Moore, and he and this show <laughs> and that show, and his whole life was was yes. uh, <laughs> per- perfect timeline according to his various TV shows mm. and soap operas before he went walking his dog. That's what made him decide what his time was. But in that prelim. It appears Pablo Fenya, who it, it lived on Gretna Green, his back his back porch is on the same alley as the back of Bundy, where Nicole's uh, garage would be, and where evidently, uh, if OJ committed the murders and went out the back gate, uh, his car would have been there. Of course, Pablo doesn't see any of that. He just comes up with, "I heard the plaintiff wail of a dog at ten fifteen." And, of course, everybody went nuts. Oh, my God, of course, that's the time of the murder. The poor dog was crying watching <laughs> his master be m- murdered. And they had a dog expert. They had a, I forget, they had somebody, like, observe the Akita for a while. And it was it was pretty funny. Uh, not really funny, but... Um, Comical, maybe. Absurd. <laughs> kind of absurd, yeah. And then later on in the trial, uh, I was provided... Um, anonymously with, uh, I guess, somebody from HBO, who sent two screenplays. Pablo Fenez was a, a kind of a screenwriter. I don't know if he's a wannabe or if he actually had screenplays. That you know, but he's a writer. Two of these individual, separate screenplays. They were like flash, flasher type murders uh, stories that he was pitching to HBO. Both of them start out with. Phrases like, uh, uh, on the one I, I recall it saying, the plaintiff, scene one, act one, uh, in the distance, the plaintiff wail of a police siren could be heard on the way to the scene. And the other one said the same thing, the plaintiff wail of a police siren. So obviously that's a little key phrase that Pablo likes to insert in his screenplays. So I guess he thought that would be pretty interesting to put into the, to the um, prelim and become quite an important person because, the prosecution, oh, everybody went nuts. Of course, the plain foil, that's it. That's the time of the death. Because um, at the prelim, O.J.'s already in custody. He's already the main suspect. They have completely uh, abandoned any sort of investigation to any other possibilities. Um, and so that's their timeline. They, they, they realized when line folks came forward, the ones that we ended up finding through their discovery and, and uh, developing what they had to say and what they saw and what they heard um, into our timeline, which was the truth, okay? It, it was all true. There was nobody trying to trying to uh, embellish anything that I recall. And so they're stuck with their 1015 because, obviously, for them to believe O.J. Simpson committed the murders, he couldn't have done it at 1040 because, like we said before, there's not there's no time. There's not there's one, 21 minutes maybe to get over there, kill Nicole because you're O.J., and then voila, we have a second person, half his age, uh, in physical shape, who arrives unexpectedly. So now he has to kill a second person, so that would pretty much amp you up a little bit. I guess he had to kill a second person. Uh and so, um, then he hit, we have the bumps on the air conditioner that we have to, we have to think about because those are tied to a phone record. Um, mm. and high, and then all, so they're stuck with 1015 because they're not stuck with it, but that's what they stuck with because yes. 
really, you need a little time to kill two people, get rid of all the weapons and the bloody clothing, and then clean up and wash up, and then get rid of all the towels and stuff you use to clean up and wash up, and then uh, it, it just it, it, it it's really absurd the timeline. We we early on knew that was a key to, to uh, our defense, and you know, F. Lee Bailey uh, was pretty much much the architect of what we called the timeline or demeanor defense, um, which, it, you know, it develops. You know, you go hit the streets, you start talking to people, and then you get records to corroborate what they're saying, for example, a, a receipt from the restaurant or your phone toll record or your computer record when you, you typed up a letter, which I think uh, uh, Denise uh, Pilnack was helping Judy Tolander type a letter right across the street from Bundy. We had, I want to say, I'm looking here, about 10 people who lived in that I that we interviewed um, that placed these murders, or at least the, the barking frantic dog who's really, you know, barking viciously at around 10.35 to give them the benefit of the doubt, to 10.40, which I think is more more in place because Heidster is the one that was walking his dog that heard the hey, hey, hey. And, um, you know, I don't know how well you guys are versed on all the little nuances of these, what I call the ear witnesses, but I thought he was one of the more important people, uh, along with Tom Lang, who I think we discussed last time. But, mm. um, um, the murder happens in your neighborhood tonight, wherever you live. Um, and the next day, you you hear about it, and sirens of police are knocking on everybody's door. You're going to come forward with, I didn't hear a thing, or I heard this, or I heard a dog bark, or I heard screaming, or I heard, you know, those very mm. things, because that's what people do. Every time there's any sort of a murder, the, usually what you hear the police do at a press conference is say, here's our number, we need to hear from the public. Somebody out mm. there heard something or saw something, okay? I mean, you, you had to see this 100,000 times across this country since then whenever there's some sort of a crime or a you know the terrorism act in boston what they do they came forward please everybody give us whatever you have um and so honest generous uh, genuine people will come forward so we had those kind of folks and really a lot of them by the time we got to them they'd been interviewed by the cops but well, i don't get to la till um july so it's late July, early August, when I'm starting to, to uh, help put together the timeline. And um, th- most of those people by now are thinking OJ's guilty. And so when I talk to people, mm. like in a case like that, I go, that's okay. That's okay. If you, you can think whatever. I don't know. I wasn't here. I have no idea. So just tell me what you heard, what times you heard, and how can we document it? And you would go right down the list with these various people. Um, there were a couple, uh, they always called it the blind date, Danny Mandel and, uh, Ellen Aronson, two, uh, wonderful people that had eaten, I think, at Metzalona and then walked home. And so you, you walk with them at the pace they thought they walked and, and things like that. And I don't know, we even, we even measured us 3,190 feet or something from the restaurant door to Bundy. Uh, don't quote me on that one, but it's somewhere in that range. And if you're slowly ambling as opposed to walking at a brisk pace, it's going to take you a little bit longer. So their time, they're getting there after 10.15, a little before 10.30, and they're walking through a completely quiet neighborhood. There's no dogs barking. There's no blood on a sidewalk. There's no, they walked right past Bundy. Uh, they didn't see anything. Not that they looked up the driveway, but I think, uh, you might glance that way. You don't know. You're, you're walking and talking. Um, well, and also if you if if you're walking past and O.J. Simpson is butchering two people violently, you might notice that. Um, you might, no, or you, you might know, or you might notice yes. too. Uh, you know, uh, blood everywhere. Um, I right. mean, look at those crime scene photos. You know, even if he right. wasn't there, uh, you right. might notice those things. But as you said. The, you know, they, they didn't see anything like that. Right. And for all we know, Ron Goldman, I doubt if Nicole could have, but Ron Goldman could still have been alive and moaning at that time if you mm. buy the prosecutor's theory 
that the murders happen at 1015. There's a big problem with that 1015 when it comes to Ron Goldman, not just that he might have been moaning and no one heard it. If you look at which which our friend Brian has done um, very well, if you look at the timeline of Ron Goldman when he leaves Metzaluna and walks home and sits showers and shaves to get ready to go out that night with some friends, and then, he, of course, he's got to take the glasses back to Nicole's. So if you look at his timeline, he can't possibly get to Bundy before 1030. Okay? So it's, mm. it's more likely that he's the hey, hey, hey that Heister heard around 1035 to 1040. Um, and we, Brian did a great job of going through that minute by minute. Uh, I don't have it committed to memory because at the time I didn't do much of a timeline as to Goldman. We were doing the timeline as to uh, the double murder and where O.J. was and, and what these people had heard. So, um, anyways, uh, trying to think where I was going with that. But oh, well, here so, I'll, let me jump in real quick because um, sure. you know a couple things there. One, we've okay. got uh, essentially if we're if we're going by what the prosecution says then uh -huh. we're really OJ has about like, you know, 25, 30 minutes max. Yep. And that's being generous 21. to yeah, go there, better. kill two people, uh, get in his car, seemingly only right. leave one eighth of one drop of blood in the car, drive right. home, uh, uh, hop right. the fence again, run all the yeah. way, instead of going into his house. And again, if you look at the photos, yeah. um, you know, or, or the diagrams yeah. of, uh, of the Rockingham estate, instead of just going into his house um, through the front entrance, you know, uh, he goes, yeah. all, he runs all the way toward, you know, through the back walkway. He, instead of going in through the garage or the laundry room into his house, he instead decides, let me run all the way, which is quite a distance to Cato's room. Uh, bang yeah. is, I don't know, head or his uh, hand three times into the air conditioner, drop the glove. Yeah. And then yep. from 1040 to 1055, he's just hanging out back there, I guess, uh, right. leaving no blood, and then goes in through the front entrance, cleans off yep. all the blood in five minutes, disposes of yep. all of this, gets in the, the limo, and drives away. Um, yeah. And, you know, and Pat, this is something I wanted to get your, your take on, too, and then I'd love to – maybe okay. we can jump in with Brian's timeline and, and some of the stuff okay. with Ron Goldman, but – you know, sure. you're a private investigator. You've spoken with, um, you know, people, uh, and, and, and trying to figure out timelines. I mean, you know, sure. we're a lot of time, you know, we're going with like five minute increments and stuff like that. But I, I think people, um, when they're looking at the case, they don't have a real concept of how, uh, of, of necessarily how long things might take. You know, I mean, I mean, right. kind of give us an example of that. You know, when you're talking with somebody, you know, um, you know, people might say, oh, well, yeah, but you have five minutes to clean off, you know, but who really yeah. takes five minutes? You know what I mean? Right. Um, give us right. a sense of that. Well, a, a good a good sense there, a good example would be um, that poor, uh, what's her name, uh, Rosa Lopez, for example. Rosa Lopez was interviewed by one of the investigators who made her observations, which were the Bronco – is still out in Rockingham. It's out there at 10 o'clock at night. It's still there in the next morning. What she did to observe that Bronco was to make a cup of tea, uh, put the collar around the dog she was going to take out to piddle, uh, one of those collars, you know, to keep from scratching yourself. Uh, that's a lot. You see dogs with those all the time. And then go outside and then bring it back in. While the investigator there makes it five minutes to do everything, five minutes to make a cup of tea. And then five minutes to put the collar on. And then about five more minutes to go out. And he's trying to make her see the Bronco at 10.15, which I don't work that way. I work, let, tell me what the truth is. That's what I need to know, whether you think O.J. did it or didn't do it. So we did that on Bundy. But in Rosa's case, there is this five-minute, five-minute, five-minute. So I spent a lot of time with her. She was very upset with that because that's what was coming out, that she saw the Bronco at 10.15, and she used to call me Patty. And she, she spoke in English, but she's patty. That's not what I told him. So I would go through it with her, at, you know, and I'd sit in her kitchen and I'd say, all right, let's make a cup of tea. And she, what she'd do is put a cup, of hot, a cup of water in a microwave and hit a minute 30. 
At the same though, you do. I said, so put the dog's collar on. Uh, he's putting the collar on the same time that he's burning or boiling or whatever it's doing, brewing in the microwave. Okay, and that takes like about a minute. And then she takes the dog outside the peas, and they bring it back in. She notices the Bronco because she's out in the front, and she goes back in. So generally, she would have been a nice, easy witness to fit into our case, but they blew her up. They just made fun of her. They made her out to be a liar and all that sort of stuff. And I think it was because of the other investigator taping this and kind of you can hear it, he's coercing her. So that was five minutes, correct? Before she could say no, he moves on to the next. Okay, so this took five minutes. But if you really sit and spend a lot of time, which I did, because it's the only case I'm working on for a year, so I spent a lot of nights on Bundy, a lot of time at Rockingham, a lot of time talking to people at night and what they saw and heard. And so that was a kind of a pretty simple witness that would have fit neatly into our case that she saw the Bronco at 10 o'clock at night or 10.01. Or, but she didn't even, she didn't wait a minute and 30 for the key to, the microwave to stop, then brew the bag, then start the thing. Okay, so it's not, it didn't take her. She was at, probably saw the Bronco at 10.01, you know, or 10.02 or something, not 10.15. So she saw that and went back in the house and then sees the thing in the next morning. And then Furman, of course, there's a whole interaction between her and Furman, which I always felt Furman wanted to make sure where her bedroom is, which is right across, it's like 20 feet from Cato's you know, across the driveway. I think Furman interviewed her. Of course, she never wrote a report or anything, but Furman interviewed her to find out if she saw him drop that dorm under the air conditioner. It's my, my theory. Um, but that, that's a situation where uh, it fit nicely in. Now, we go to the Bundy, and I forget the order I bumped into these people, but um, I think Denise Tilnack and that, uh, her couple friends were, were some of the first. Uh, I think... Um, Tom Lang was in the middle somewhere because he was reluctant to speak uh, until he finally called and said, come on over. Uh, there was a couple people I spoke to that walked that night in the same area, but we didn't call them. Um, two of them were just too afraid to even come to, didn't want to come to court, had careers they didn't want. But they they were just like everybody else. They saw what happened. Um, we had enough of a mm. time Lang. We didn't have four witnesses in that were, that one was an actress and, um, had a prior bad relationship where there was restraining orders and and perhaps photographs because everybody has photographs you know and they're willing to sell them so I think she was she didn't say this but I I hinted that is that a, is that some of the reasons why you don't want to come forward and it was but she saw Schwab twice that evening hey nice dog quiet evening her and her uh, date from that evening who I spoke with also they had just gone for a little walk from ten they left their apartment at ten o'clock. And I think she lived on, uh, I know where she lived. I got it right here close by, but she lived there with me. But she lived in the neighborhood, okay? Montana mm-hmm. or Gorham or somewhere, an apartment in that area, okay? So she really, um, saw things. She saw the, the, the nice dog to Schwab. So here's, here's someone that could have come to court. Cause you know, said, I don't think they use Schwab in the trial. They just used him in the prelim. I don't recall him being in the trial. This would have been someone that kind of corroborates somebody else. In other words, she sees Schwab. She says, nice dog. He might have mm. remembered a woman. She's very attractive, a young young kid that was an act, actress. So those kind of things you put together in a timeline. And, um, and, you know, then you start to try to finesse it down by looking at records. Okay, like, how did you know you left at 10 o'clock? Well, we just finished... Uh, you know, a phone call with my friend, here's my phone record, that, that, that. So that kind of helped her. Then we had the, the you know, Pilnack and that crowd um, that had been typing a letter and washing a wine glass, I think, and looking out the window, and it was a very quiet evening to all these people until a guy named Heidstra, well, Lang's our first witness in the timeline because he sees, he's the last guy to see Nicole alive, and that's at 10 o'clock. And so mm-hmm. I think whoever he saw at 10 um, they left and came back is all I can think. They certainly didn't sit there from 10 o'clock until uh, even 10.15 at the murder because other people would have seen this truck and heard all this commotion. Mm. So um, I thought Lang was very important. And um, 
Judy Talander, Francesca Harmon, and Judy, uh, uh, not Judy, what was her name? Denise Pilnick all corroborate each other with, uh, with their, with their timing and their, uh, where they'd left and when they got home and all that. Well, Denise was at her own home, but the next day when, when Eric came to her house, she says, look, here's, here's the letter I typed on my computer, 1028. Okay, so we typed this letter, 1028. We sat on the porch for a second, said, said our goodbyes. Francesca drove, made a U-turn right in the corner, right in front of the Bundy house to go home. Uh, it was quiet. Well, Ben Adder didn't want to hear any of that. You know, he heard that in the first couple of days. Well, actually, I think he heard it after OJ's in custody because they don't really hit the timeline until after OJ's in custody and they hear from all these neighbors. So, you know, they kind of, don't give that a hoot, right? Which, when you're in law enforcement, you obviously want to talk to people that have no, no dog in the fight. Oh, I hate that's a bad pun. They don't have a dog <laughs> in the fight, but, but, you know, they came forward in their neighborhood that, like, and he said, look, I have a murder in my neighborhood. I'm going to come forward and say that I, I didn't know Nicole, but she's my neighbor. We didn't mm. ex- exchange pleasantries, but I came forward with what I had. I'm here to help law enforcement. And they made fun of her in the trial. Because she had two watches. she I think she's a marathon runner. She had a runner's watch on one hand and one on the other. So they made a big joke out of her. They just belittled all of these people that came forward because the real timeline, like like we know, is 1035 to 1045. That's when these murders happen. Because Robert Heidstra had his statement. And he heard the hey, hey, hey. That's the man who walked his dogs every night at the same time. So... You know, when we finally found him and we talked to him and uh, we found him in his apartment, we were down in the garage and we were talking about what kind of vehicle did you see? And there was one in the garage, a little Jeep. He pointed a Jeep just like that. He said he saw a Jeep. Now, that that conflicts with Tom Lang, who saw a big Ford F-350. But we don't know what that F-350 is, but we know it's not a Bronco. And if you believe Heidstra, which the cops did, you know, the cop one, that when the cops interview, and it's in his report that Heister said it was a Jeep like vehicle. Don't you think by now a cop would have said, no, we got OJ in custody. You sure it wasn't a Bronco? You sure hmm. it wasn't a white Bronco? Here's a picture of a white Bronco. You sure it wasn't that? I think it was that. Are you sure? You probably made a mistake. No, no, no. And he, he showed us. That he was standing in the same place the cop interview. He said, no, that, you see that Jeep right there? That's the kind of vehicle I saw come up and go south on Bundy, which would make the timeline even more difficult for the prosecution. That's why I didn't like all that. But I interviewed Heidstra, and then a number of nights I just went over in the neighborhood and surreptitiously watched to see if he's consistent. And I don't know, I must have watched him five, ten nights, you know, walk these dogs in the same way he said, same time, he gets home the same time. So he was very important. He's like the ear witness to the murder, in my opinion. He hears the Akita barking ferociously. He hears the hey, hey, hey. He hears a gate slam. He hears two men arguing after he hears a gate slam. Now, that gate slam is on the way out. It's up the steps and on the way out to the back. It's the front gate and the back gate don't, don't slam. They make a thud. They're, they're not metal gates. There was a, middle, a metal gate in the middle walkway there, and that's what I believe he heard slam. Then he hears two men arguing, okay? That's pretty important stuff, in my opinion, um, because I think he heard the murder. And after the hey, 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 which we probably think is Goldman, or it could be one of these guys when Goldman comes up. I don't think Goldman comes up and doesn't shout, or I know he fought for his life, so I believe he probably was the hey, hey, hey. And then you hear men, not man, men, well, uh, a guy could argue with himself, I guess, but he hears men arguing after Mm. the gate slam. I think those are the the people that committed the double murder. And we th- we believe, obviously, from the from going back to the prelim, the medical examiner, Dr. Golden, who did the autopsies, testifies it, it, it seemed like two different size knife wounds. Therefore, two different knives were used. So um, those were all important, and they all kind of got shut down by the prosecution. They obviously never used Golden again, the guy that did the autopsies, the medical examiner that performed the autopsies. They didn't use him. They used uh, the fellow named Lakshman and the Indian fellow with the long name, and they used him for like seven days to come up with all these forgazy theories about how it could have happened and while the knife wound came and what this, you know, forget the timeline. It was They made it like one knife did all this damage. 
And so now you have to think, however old OJ was at the time, 50, I'm sorry, 40, I think six or seven, uh, splashing away at two people. I, it's, it's absurd. So that this man, uh, who's traveling across the country to see a recital suddenly gets pissed off and in a rage and drives over because I love that word. Oh, it's a rage killing. That's just like the plane of whale. You damn right. It was a rage killing. Well, if you can't do a rage double murder and then get on an airplane like nothing happened, you know, just n- n- a 45 year old guy can't do that after a violent struggle and a violent fight. And I forget the total amount of stab wounds, but just <coughs> stand in your living room and just punch in the air that many times, you're going to mm. be a little, you're going to be a little winded at least. <laughs> no sign of that. No sign of that from OJ. Uh, with any of the people he interacted, Alan Park in the limo, all the way to the airport. There was a couple of fellas that saw him at the airport that got autographs. They had they had seen Marcus Allen earlier in the day. Hey, we saw Marcus. Yeah, he's going to the Cayman. Very am- amicable, a- amiable chatting by OJ with all kinds of people. Um, uh, we had the transponder from the limo to show exactly what time he got into the airport, which I forget was 11-something. I don't have it here, but that's those those are their records. But we used as many quotes government records, phone bills, phone records, uh, you know, receipts, things like that. We can't make those up. Those came from some other place, you know. Um, mm. Help us develop a complete timeline from ten o'clock till the time OJ gets on an airplane. Then we go through what he did in, on the airplane, who he talked to on the airplane. That's not really a timeline. That moved into our demeanor. And he lands in Chicago. And uh, I interviewed a lot of those people from Hertz and the O'Hare Plaza Hotel and American Airlines folks. And that all fit right into the demeanor of someone that it's pretty unlikely this guy just committed a double murder and is behaving this way. Uh, there was a lot of behavior he didn't do that you would think a double murderer would do. I might have talked about this last time. I forget. But... You know, you kind of look behind you. Uh, yeah. How close are they? How did anybody find my knives and my bloody clothes? What is, you know, if, if you really did this, you've got to be thinking, um, which probably I've been in cases where the, where the defendant calls his girlfriend or his daughter, Hey, get that stuff out of the glove compartment or, you know, move, remove that change because it was a robbery that they took a, a thing off the counter and there was, it was all loose change and he's calling his mm-hmm. girlfriend from the jail. Um, but you would think Simpson would have called back home to Arnell, say, hey, how was the movies? What's going on? Anything happening? Mm. We dream. I'll call you tomorrow. I mean, he Create none something. Of you're, cre- you're trying to, you know, uh, uh, get him from me. Well, e- and even on that, Pat, um, let's, uh, uh yeah. l- let me ask you, uh, you know, again, this is, this is the, one of the major problems with the prosecution's timeline is that it is so short that you're almost led to believe, well, somebody else had to have been there. You know, he had to have had an accomplice or someone else had to have helped him. And, of course, the prosecution doesn't want to go down that road because then it's who is this person and, you know, where is he? But um, when, you know, so, again, let's just we're just going by the prosecution's own timeline at this point. Yep. So uh, O.J. has killed Cole and Ronald, um, if you know, from 10.15 to 10.40. So in that 25 minutes, yeah. he's killed them, jumped in his car, he gets home, he's running into Cato's uh, air conditioner, drops the glove, then goes into his house. Five minutes, he cleans himself off. But before O.J. gets into the limo and drives away with Alan Park, him and Cato uh, investigate this noise yeah. that Cato heard. So yeah. explain that because this is another one of these moments where OJ and Cato are in the back alley where OJ oh, yeah. has apparently dropped the glove and yeah. OJ doesn't, he doesn't, you know, I mean, explain that to us, Pat, because this is one of these moments well, that is just mind boggling. Yeah. Because if OJ said, no, I didn't hear anything, but yeah, and they go look over there. If OJ is the guy that did a double murder and banged into an air conditioner, first of all, who would, bring back one piece of evidence to your own property. If you had a glove and you just commit, you'd probably stop at a McDonald's and throw it in a garbage can or 
or out the window or into a lake or something. You wouldn't bring it back onto your property where there's no other evidence of a murder. And you're going to bring evidence from a double murder you just committed back to your own property. Makes no sense. But even if you were dumb enough to do that and then Cato alerts you that he heard something, let me go see. And then you take that glove and you take it with you to Chicago or something, you know. I mean, a guy that's just done it isn't going to just kind of laugh that kind of thing off, you know. Mm. It, had it been a gun, for example. Hey, I heard a gunshot over there. Let's go look. <laughs> oh, and, and if, you know, you take that gun and you get rid of that gun somewhere. So OJ doesn't mm. do anything like that. So that that's consistent with someone that has nothing to do with a murder and is about to get on a plane uh, to go to Chicago. Doesn't even know <laughs> anything has happened yet. So mm. well, and consistent with the idea that there was no glove there until right. it was planted there. I mean, again, keep right. this in mind, you know, if this is confusing. You've got, before O.J. gets in the car to drive to LAX, him and Cato go back there with flashlights, okay? Yep. And O.J. Yep. goes the way where he would have gotten to the air conditioner first, okay? Yeah. And by his end, him and, you know, and Cato testified to this as well. And he's back yep. there. He's either too, you know, again, if he's the murderer and he somehow dropped the glove by accident, he doesn't notice yeah. it? The second right. time, you know, Cato doesn't no. know unless Cato's in right. on it, you know? And even yeah, so, no, I mean, Cato doesn't say anything. Hey, there's a bloody glove right. back here. Yeah, yeah let's get rid uh, of it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, and then again, no. OJ also, you know, and he, I, I mean, th that is one of the, the biggest sort of, again, and it's just overlooked. You know, nobody wants well, to, the prosecution doesn't want to <laughs> uh, go into that. The detectives don't want to go into that because it, it right. makes... No, as you said, I mean, again, um, this is something, uh, and maybe you can talk to this too, Pat, is sure. people seem to just sort of dismiss logic when it comes to this. And I know there's a lot of people out there, uh, you know, right. amateur, you know, online sleuths and detectives oh, yeah. and things, but think yeah. logically, think like you're a detective. Who the yeah. hell would do this? You know, exactly. uh, I mean, there's so many illogical decisions that you have to yep. assume OJ uh, w was was doing that just yep. don't make any sense. And they exactly. don't line up with, you know, I mean, again, he's stupid enough to leave a glove, yet where's yeah. the murder weapon? He's smart enough right. to get rid of that and his clothes. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and, and uh, I mean, I don't, do, do you see a lot of that as a private investigator, this sort of just disregard well, for logic? Yeah, and I when I talk to friends, and it's all, all over the news and things like, like, for example, the, the Casey Anthony case, friends of mine were talking to me about it. That it, it does think it's, it's absurd to think someone, anyone would search, say, chloroform 84 freaking times. It's like saying, would you search bologna hot dogs 84 times? Wouldn't you after four or five times or maybe 10 or maybe 20 or maybe 30 or maybe 40 or maybe 50 or maybe 60. When you do it like that, people are looking at you and going, well, you know, with their mouth open, catching flies. They go, oh, yeah, well, you know, because right away they go, oh, my God, start chloroform 84 times. It's like, oh, my God, a plane of oil of a dog. Oh, mm. you know, you just look at it logically and, and then you break it down that way. That's why I don't care if someone says, I think your client did it. Tom Lang says to me, you know, I'll talk to you, but I know your client did it because he's got that cut on his finger. I said, that's okay. Uh, I don't know how he got, I mean, I did know at the time how he got the finger, but I'm not going to tell a witness what I think happened to the cut finger in Chicago. I go, it's okay. You could think whatever you want. All I want to know from you, Tom, is it's what the you deserve that. Is that all? Just tell me the truth. And if you saw a Bronco, great. Show, tell me it was a Bronco. I don't lead him like that, but he says, I saw this white Ford. I go, what kind of a Ford was? You know, a pickup truck, like a 250 or three. I think it was a 350, he says. F-350. Well, the other investigator's standing there with me. He gets done. He goes, he wants to punch me. He goes, you see what you just did? I go, what did I just do? That's a white Ford. They're going to say it's a white Ford Bronco. I go, well, let's check it out more. And then we, we learn later that this Tom Lang owned 11 Ford vehicles in his mm. life, you know. He's one of those Ford guys, not a Chevy guy. So he has every <laughs> one of these kind of vehicles. He knows the difference. It's not like saying, oh, do you have a Honda CRV or a CRX? You know, I can understand those kind of mistakes. Uh, but not a Ford F-350. When you've owned them, 
and you've also owned the Bronco and all of that. You don't make, that's not a mistake you're going to make. So those kind of things for me were powerful, you know? Um, mm. And then, like I say, the observations of the various people make the murders happen. <clears throat> I mean, they have to happen at a certain time. You don't get to guess when they happened. You know, there's, you can't come back in a week and say, oh, it happened this time. So you get it as fast as you can. You start to interview people and knock on doors. And that's what the detectives, I, I have to look at the dates again, but you would hope that's what they were doing the next day. But I know they weren't. They were concentrating on getting ready for the preliminary hearing. Hearing, they were going downtown to Ross Cutlery to look at a tray of knives uh, because someone, Hector Camacho or some guy like that, I forget his name, said, "Hey, OJ was filming a movie downtown, and he happened to stop in our store, and he bought a knife for a hundred bucks." Who? Wow, boy, they got the whole crew down there at Ross Cutlery. Um, you know, no receipt or anything. I would have been nice to have a receipt, a detailed receipt, but he gave him a hundred cash and. Probably didn't get a receipt, and the owner probably didn't record anything. That hundred mm. went right into his pocket. So, <laughs> um, so you've got these guys getting ready for a preliminary hearing because they found a glove at Rocking that we believe Mark Furman planted. Had it not been there, they probably would not. They wouldn't have even gone to Rockingham if it, was, if it wasn't for Mark Furman saying, "Hey, I got prior history with this guy. Let me show you where he lives." Another. Think logically. Another absolute load of crap um, that the lead detectives don't know how to get to Rockingham. They've been detectives for between them 60, 70 years in Los Angeles. They know how to get <laughs> yeah, to Rockingham. I, <laughs> I got to Rockingham off an airport, and they've been there in my life with a map, okay? Yeah. I got to go right <laughs> to Rockingham getting off an airplane. So these guys testify that we needed to make a notification, which is another load of crap. Um, you need to, to to knock on doors at three and four in the morning next door. Did you hear? What did you hear? Or people are going to come out at that hour. Mm. Uh, you know, that's what you do. That isn't there some show the first forty eight hours or something? You see how these guys got to go into high gear. Um, and what happened here was they went into high gear, high gear after OJ. They never looked any other way but OJ Simpson. That glove, Mark Furman betrayed all of his police buddies. Of the prosecution, and most importantly, he betrayed uh, Goldman family and the and the and OJ and his family. Totally betrayed him. And oh, guess what? We got a white supremacist in the middle of this investigation. And guess what? He finds quote blood on the Bronco. Oh, guess what? He finds stuff in the Bronco. Oh, guess what? He finds a glove by the air conditioner. Oh, guess what? He sees a shovel in a plastic bag. Give me a break. I mean, this mm. this whole country went hook, line, and sinker in the preliminary hearing, and I know for, from a source in the DA's office that, that I heard say after the preliminary hearing was over, they had a meeting, and they had nicknames for, for um, Van Adder and Lang because the prosecutor's thinking, this is all you have, and we're going premeditated first-degree murder looking at the death penalty, and we have a glove. We have nothing left. And then what happens after that meeting? All of a sudden, there's blood on the back gate. All of mm. a sudden, three months later, there's blood on the sock in the in OJ's house. It has Nicole's blood on it, which wasn't in the it wasn't on the floor. <coughs> excuse me. When the first cops came on the scene and videotaped the house, it came later. And then it's photographed in the middle of the floor. And then months later, oh, guess what? The sock has Nicole's blood on it. After five different labs looked at it, and in each lab report or police report or whatever report there is, in the box observations, no blood observed. Okay, so then three months later, there's a big fat drop in the cold blood in it. Uh, no trace evidence from Bundy. No Ron Goldman uh, evidence. No blood from Ron Goldman. The only time you have Nicole and Bro Goldman's blood is in a, a, a smear, and the, the location of it is, on the side, the, on the passenger side of the console that sits in the middle of the Bronco, which is far more circumstantial that Mark Furman opened that door and stuck it there to find it later and become the big hero. But then when he hears about the air conditioner, he takes it out from there and goes and puts, because you notice he leaves uh, Van Adder, Lang, and Phillips a number of times. He leaves them at the Ashford gate when they're ringing, trying to get, wake somebody up. And goes around and says, "Hey, fellas, come on over here. We got, we got. I see blood on the Bronco." It's, we, yeah, yeah. 
you know? Uh, I think I went through all that last time, but, but, uh, mm-hmm. uh, I think he, ju- then he jumps the wall. And when he hears about Cato, cause they're bringing in Arnell and they're making the notification in Chicago to OJ and calling everybody and trying to get, figure out what's going on. Furman disappears, finds Cato, hears about this, brings him out to the bar, uh, sets him down at the kitchen table, the bar table, wherever he was. You fellas need to talk to this guy and disappears again. And then comes in back in and says, Hey, come over here. I found a glove. Okay, so he already knew about the air conditioner bump. And so now we see a glove at whatever time it is now. It's got to be, shit, three or four in the morning. Um, and and again, this is, this is after O.J. and Cato had gone back there at, and saw nothing. Exactly, exactly. Unless they're both lying, and then they're both in on it, you know? And, then, I mean, right. again, right. this is it, – it, the, the prosecution's own story is more conspiratorial. Exactly. I mean, if because it's, suddenly it's okay, everybody is in on it. Yeah, yeah. And then when he comes back from and plus now think about this, I'll forget about all the demeanor in Chicago. But when he finally gets the the phone call and he's freaking out and calling back, get me on the next plane to back to Chicago. How about get me on the next plane to China if you did a double murder and you're you're the public figure that O.J. Simpson is? Get me know, on a, yeah. a plane somewhere other than. LAX, where they're going to be waiting for me. And hmm. they weren't even waiting there. And he goes back to his home, where evidently there was a glove that he didn't know about. Uh, um, and then they won't let him bring in his bag, so he hands his bag off, I think it was to Bob, Bob Kardashian, who went and threw it in his car. And then later, um, Kathy Randa gets it from Bob Kardashian and brings it in the house and throws it in the closet. With the, everything in, intact, she took the clothes out that were in it and put, put them in his drawers and whatever, hung them up. But the bag, the, the actual bags with the with the uh, luggage tags still on them, the little white tags you get from American Airlines and stuff, they're still on there. They had three search warrant tries at that house. They didn't take those bags to see what they are. But then you hear everybody, uh, the conspiracy side of the other side, oh, Kardashian's involved. Oh, Kathy Randa's involved. You know, it's like, you know, if your best friend, was just accused of murder. I could see saying, I'll do anything I can for you. I will mortgage my house. I will help you get the best lawyer. We're going to get you through this. We'll help you. I'm not going to say, give me the evidence and I'll go hide it for you. I'm not yeah, going to be yeah. um, no, no normal person. Now, maybe gangs would do that. But his circle of friends and family were all upstanding citizens. They're not going to hide evidence. They may say, hey, well, Kardashian did. He says, I know Shapiro. Let me see if I can get him to make this go away, you know. Um, mm. Those are the kind of things that his friends did. Kathy Renner says, let me get a hold of Air American Airlines. Let me get a hold of, uh, you know, some way to get you back here. Let me try to find out something. No one knew. None of OJ's friends didn't know anything other than Nicole had been killed. They didn't know how. They didn't know she got run over by a truck. They didn't know she'd been shot. They didn't know any detail. Okay? No one did, except for the cops and whoever the murderers were. OJ didn't know anything about it. All the way clear on his flight back to Chicago. He doesn't even know there's a second person. He learns about that, then, you know, on that flight. And he's sitting next to a guy that's documenting everything he's saying, the, the Mark Partridge, the trademark patent lawyer, uh, Harvard educated yeah. guy. Not making what up you- stuff. What do you what do you make of the um uh because we're coming up towards the break and I, I do want to continue a little bit in the, okay. the second hour some more um specifically on Ron <laughs> Goldman's uh whereabouts uh because again if you just logically uh look at what he did when he got out of Mezzaluna, I mean he had to have been at the very earliest gotten to the polls at ten thirty. But before we get to that, what do you what do you make of the coroner not being called until like ten hours later? Uh, is this again just sort of incompetence from the police? Um, because, because I mean, what, when the coroner gets there, I mean, he determines that the death is between nine and twelve. I mean, that's a huge window. Um, yeah. You know, again, were, were they killed at eleven uh, fifty? You know, um, what do you make of that? Well, you know, uh, I don't know. I I don't know police procedure well enough to know when the medical examiner gets called, but I, I think it's like right away. Uh, hmm. that brings more expertise, if you have, if you will, to the scene, right? You have those kind of people, um, involved. You don't just not notify them till the next day, I don't think. 
So it's just part of, it could be the chaos of a, of a double murder and finding out it's a celebrity and all that. Everybody tries to, you know, dot their I's and cross their T's. I don't, it's hard for me to explain the LAPD, I'll tell you, other than, uh, <laughs> you know, that they were incompetent in this investigation because they focused, they did not ever even attempt to eliminate OJ Simpson, which you could do in two, not two seconds, but rather quickly with what I did. You could rather quickly see that no, this trip to Chicago wasn't unannounced and like, like some fugitive in the middle of the night. And no, uh, when the judge says, are you sure this was, he just took off in the middle of the night. And then they, oh, look, Van Adder, let me fix my affidavit. After speaking with Arnell, okay, now, Arnell never told him OJ just took off in the middle of the night because if you did speak to Arnell, she would have said he's at a Hertz function. Uh, he was here for a recital. You know, if you did do that, you know, even if they're lying, you get them on the record as what, what, where is your dad? What is he doing? What is he doing there? Get them nailed down. Uh, if they're helping him, you, you're going to destroy these lies later. If you're a half-ass detective, I think you're going to, you're going to punch holes in. I mean, a, a good investigator, good detective punches holes in the other side's case and bolsters their own with, like I say, with records, you know, uh, uh I don't know. I, I can't explain why the LAP did, did anything that they did. We just, you know, we kind of pointed out all the mistakes and then we get <laughs> accused of, you know, police, can, you know, we're, we say the police are so dumb that they're incompetent, but yet they're so smart. They all conspired to frame an innocent man. No, they didn't all conspire. They got tricked by a white supremacist cop uh, who was a rip. Okay, time. <laughs> I'm sorry, Pat. What did you say there? I lost you. Oh, I thought I thought that was a signal that we were breaking or something. Um, oh no, no, uh, that's just someone honking a horn outside my house. Okay, all right, all right. So it, to me, it was uh, you know, it's pretty easy to figure out what happened here in my mind. I mean, it's pretty simple, and no one will go there. You know, think mm. about this. Mark Furman took when he when we find you know. We're blasting away at him from the preliminary hearing on when he, when he describes the gloves as them. Okay, he says, that, I mm-hmm. saw them at his feet. Okay, from the prelim, all, and then learning about his racism and his uh, past and his uh, psychological problems and all that sort of stuff, all the way to finding the Furman tapes. Okay, they were still, until those tapes were came forward, they were ready. They were attacking all of our, what we called Furman witnesses. As liars, every one of them got together to lie against Mark Furman. Now, what, why would you do that? Why would a totally innocent person that had this this uh, contact with Furman even want to come forward into an international uh, circus on television where the whole world, as soon as your name is out there, now everybody that's mm. ever met you in your life could be trying to sell a 10 grand story to the National Enquirer. Oh, when we were in high school, we got all screwed up and stole a car, you know, that kind of stuff. These were just normal people that that didn't want to be involved but said, hey, here's my experience with Mark Furman. And yet we were able to convince Ito not to have to turn these names over because the minute we did, and it proved true, the minute we gave uh, a couple of names to Darden, there was a TV crew on this gal's uh, house. She did not have the house in her name. She didn't have utilities in her name, so there was only one way the media crews could have got on her front porch. And they got that mm. information from Darden or someone in the DA's office. So it just it made no sense the way they attacked anybody uh, that we brought forward, you know? I mean, I guess mm. they didn't attack the pilot, you know, that flew that plane. But even, <laughs> even that one guy, guy. Yeah, the one guy didn't get attacked, I guess. Um, but, you know, the the hotel people, the Hertz people, everybody we ran into was just telling the truth. So, mm. Well, uh, we're uh, we're coming up on the break right now, and uh, we okay. will be continuing this conversation with Pat McKenna in the second hour, so lots more, so stay tuned.
I like very much radio. You're an American institution. American Freedom Radio. And I hope people support American Freedom Radio. And I hope people vote with their dollars and really understand the value of having American Freedom Radio. Because that's my family. If you love me at all, Jack Blood, support American Freedom Radio. Like my family has literally disowned me. <laughs> American Freedom Radio, Danny and Don and those guys, those are my actual family. So please, please support these guys because they have all the technology. They have all these great things that they're going to do. But obviously, they can't do it all by themselves. So not only would I like to see you support them, I'd like to see you retweet them and repost them and really get involved and get on the, the bandwagon, so to speak, on doing that do-it-yourself promotion because they're a do-it-yourself radio network, and, uh, and, and we just need that so much. Did you know there are 3 million edible food plants on Earth and none have the nutritional value of the hemp plant? HempUSA.org offers you hemp protein powder. It does not contain chemicals or THC, is non-GMO, and is 100% gluten-free. Hemp protein powder burns fat, builds muscle, contains 53% protein, and feeds the body the nutrients it needs. Call 888-910-4367 and see what our powder, seeds, and oil can do for you only at HempUSA.org. HempUSA.org introduces three brand new detox formulations of micro plant powder. Brain Fuel for depression, bipolar disorders, and stress. Total Care, anti-cancer agent that cleans the liver and organs and increases memory. Rejuvenate, invigorates and heals the body, mind, and spirit. These products are your alternative to pharmaceuticals. Call 888-910-4367 and like us on Facebook. We ship worldwide only at HempUSA.org. We all know that they're not telling us the truth. So stand up for your rights, demand the real medicine, and your right to use it and grow it. This is Rick Simpson, and you're listening to American Freedom Radio. What about show business? Show business, completely dishonest, corrupt, and full of shit, but in a nice way. <laughs> Plenty of expensive drugs and perverted sex. If you're going to be full of shit, might as well enjoy your work. <laughs> Then you have the media, not just the news media, let's include them all. The media are almost literally exploding with bullshit because they're located right at the crossroads of all the other bullshit. The media are made up of equal parts, advertising, politics, business, public relations, and show business. These people are sitting right at bullshit junction. <laughs> There's enough bullshit in the media for Texas to open a branch office. And you still have enough left over to start two law firms and a Christian bookstore. What has American Freedom Radio ever done for us? Provide us for free education? Well, that's obviously effective. But apart from reversing the dumbing down of America... All the information they provide is free? What about the free podium for broadcast activists to speak from, then? Eh? Uh, exploiting uh, commonplace corruption? They help uh, vulnerable people who don't have a voice? I'll uh, bring you light to uh, important information nobody else does. Well, they never sent so hung up or cut off their guests? Well, that's no fun, is it? Well, they created a fantastic alternative media source during an era of bad, manipulative, and infiltrated mainstream and alternative media shows and scum. Okay, well, apart from the free education, free information, free podium for broadcast activists to speak from, exposing commonplace corruption, helping vulnerable people without a voice, bringing light to important information nobody else does, and creating a fantastic commercial free alternative media source in a sea of bad, manipulative mainstream and alternative media shows and scum, what has American Freedom Radio ever done for us? Donate to American Freedom Radio today. No rules. No rules. No taboo topics. No taboo topics. No fear of doom. No fear of doom. We are. We are. American Freedom Radio. American Freedom Radio. Ow. Hawkins Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything, geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Come and 
to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redman. Okay, everybody, welcome back to Porkins Policy Radio. I am your host, Pierce Redman. If you are just joining us in the second hour, we are uh, still speaking with uh, Pat McKenna, all about the OJ trial, um, Pat's own experiences as an investigator for the defense. And we've been discussing uh, the various timelines. And we've, uh, you know, I think Pat and I did a pretty good job of poking many holes in the prosecution's timeline. But let's, um, Pat, let's focus a little bit on um, what actually transpired, or, or a more realistic timeline, uh, one that, uh, you know, you helped work on. And, and I'd also love to uh, touch a little bit on our good friend Brian Heiss, who um, has an excellent right. timeline that I will uh, link up to in the show notes that is really fascinating because he, uh, Brian focuses on uh, R- Ron Goldman's movements yep. on the night. And, uh, and yep. I, we, you know, we, Brian and I spoke about this um, several episodes back, but uh, Brian uh, lays out really interesting stuff that, again, lines up with uh, things that you discovered while you were investigating, uh, things like Denise Pilnack's uh, assertion that she heard her own sort of plaintive wail of dogs around 1034, 1036. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so we, we've got Ron Goldman, um, he finishes his shift at Mezzaluna. Uh, he, yep. he, uh, uh, at around, uh, 945, he speaks with Nicole Simpson, uh, who tells him, uh, uh to take no. her mother Judith's glasses, uh, and, and okay. bring them over to her house. Um, he, uh, we, we, he then kind of sticks around for another 15, 20 minutes. He's talking, uh, with John DeBello, who's the owner, uh, and a few yep. other people. He makes plans to meet up with his friend Stuart Tanner, who was the bar- bartender at, uh, Mezzaluna. They're going to meet at Baja Cantina, which was a very popular nightclub on Sundays. Yep. Uh, then he, uh, he returns home at 10 o'clock. And, and Pat, this is even, even the prosecution goes with this, correct? Yeah. Well, I would hope so because they spoke at length with um, uh, John DeBello and the guy that Tanner, I forget his first name, and uh, there was a couple of female employees. Now, we tried to talk to them. Uh, Crawford was one's name. But they were not cooperating with us. You know, they were all down. You know, we were there to help O.J. Simpson. They are already thinking O.J. Simpson killed their good friend Ron, Ron Goldman. Mm. So we have nearly the opportunity to discuss with them what the cops did, which w- would show you <laughs> it would show you that your timeline of ten fifteen is ridiculous. Okay, if you mm. if you same thing. Obviously, these people have no reason to lie. The people at Mesaluna, no reason to lie. Their good friend was murdered. Now they think it's OJ, but they are going to confirm and, and document as best as they can their their friend Ron Goldman. Well, who we what time he clocked out, then he sat and shot mm-hmm. the breeze for at a table. And he got the call about the glass. I'll bring the glasses. Um, you know, and then he's got to walk home like a fifth of a mile to, to his apartment. Um, you know, and it's, it's funny because it was never presented by the, by the prosecution, and, and nor did we really focus on Goldman at the time. The only thing I did was fight with Shapiro, who wanted me to find out how long it took to drive from Metzaluna to Bundy. And I didn't do it for a while. And finally in a big meeting, he blows up at me. I, when I tell you to do something, I want you to do it. I said, well, I'll get to it. But if you read the <laughs> discovery, Ron Goldman didn't drive from Metzaluna to Bundy, Bob. You know? So it's like, <laughs> fuck you. You don't know what you're talking about. Why don't you read some discovery instead of trying to plead O.J. Simpson guilty every five minutes? Um, but anyway, so... You know, so the Metzaluna folks, and understandably so, they want to talk to us. They think they're helping the other side, so to speak, you know. And they don't know me from Adam. I'm a private investigator from Florida. They they aren't going to talk to me. They were polite enough to take my card and the other investigator's card, but we never really got very far with them. But, you know, his timeline is impossible to fit the prosecutor. Ron Goldman could not have been at Bundy at 10, uh, at 10 15. Could not have been there at that time. Mm. And again, well, look at the logic that, like Brian did, he did such a fabulous job of, 
of, you know, writing up, you know, you know, the fact that he would, he would shit, shower and shave if he's going over to Nicole's house to go out later afterwards. He's going to change his smelly restaurant, uh, outfit, uh, into something nice because he remember he was in pretty uh, cool outfit. You know, he had like a shirt and Levi's and some, uh, mm-hmm. fancy boots, like high white boots or something. So he, he took the time to change out of what he was wearing to get ready to go to Baja Cantina with a stop, you know, at, at Nicole's to drop off the glass. And, mm. and, um, you know, he can't possibly be there at, at, at 10, 15. Right, again, I mean, and if people are having trouble wrapping their head around that, he, 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 he gets, let's say he gets home at 10 o'clock, which is giving him, you know, five minutes to walk home, uh, you know, up the, st- you know, cross over, yep. like, to a big avenue, up the stairs into his house. I mean, that's even being generous. He's probably there at 10.05. Yep. Uh, but yep. even so, he's there at 10 o'clock. Um, he, uh, he eats, a spinach salad. There's no denying that it was in his stomach contents. Yeah. Um. So, uh, you know, he's he so he's preparing a salad. He at least yeah. changes his clothes because we know he's not wearing the same clothes. Uh, you know, his Mezzaluna uh outfit. Exactly. Now, exactly. So, uh, again, logically, this guy is a model. Uh, you look at pictures of him. He's always, you know, dressed very well. He does his hair. You, it, come yeah. on, you know, again, you're going out, you know, Sunday night, yeah. the, the hot spot yeah. in LA, you're probably going to take a shower. And again, yeah. Pat, this is one of those things where, you know, how long does it take to really take a shower? You know, is, is he taking a, a two minute shower and then, you know, a minute to dry yeah. off? I mean, that's unrealistic. No, I um, mean, logically, it's, um, He's going to take a good shower to clean up. Look, I tend a bar for 12 years in Chicago and down here. Back in the day when cigarettes were in, inside. When you come home from a, a shift of a, as a bartender, waiter, whatever, you think you've been running around sweating these cigarette smoke. Now, he didn't have cigarette smoke on him, but, you know, you smell like restaurant food. You're in it by a grill. You're just going to mm-hmm. reek of that. It's not going to go out on the town without taking a pretty good shower. You're going to wash your hair, brush your teeth, wash your teeth, uh, you know, change clothes, get all new clothes on. You probably take the clothes you were wearing and throw them in the hamper to keep them from even getting near the clothes you maybe lay on your bed or bring into the bathroom to get into. So uh, you've got to think about that second by second or minute by minute, how long that's going to take reasonably. You know, we can't now to give them the benefit of the doubt. He gets home, he rushes, he jumps in the shower, shit, shower, shave, boom, I'm over at Bundy in time to get killed at 10, 15. They wasn't doing it. He wasn't in a rush. He was in no rush to do anything. He was, you know, probably clean enough. He didn't run home from Metzaluna, walked home, <laughs> pardon me, <coughs> you know, and yeah. got cleaned up. Well, and when if he home. was in a rush, like the prosecution would reiterate over and over again, he could. it's shorter to Nicole's. He could have yeah. walked to Nicole's and back to his house in a shorter amount exactly. of time than it took for him to go home, as you say, shower, eat something, get dressed, and then go to Nicole's. I mean, right. you know, it, it's just, again, illogical unless he's not in a rush. But, of course, right. based on the prosecution's uh, timeline, he has to be in a rush. Even though he said he's meeting his, he's, he's, um, he's uh, meeting his friend Stuart Tanner. You know, yeah. uh, who would yeah. usually get off at around 11. Okay, so, yeah. you know, I mean, figure you'd get there at 1130 at this club. I mean, again, what is the rush? Uh, he works right. in a restaurant, okay? He doesn't have to be there in the morning on Monday. Right. They're yeah. going out to a club on Sunday night. I mean, come on. You know, there's yeah. he's, uh, again, people need to think somewhat logically here. Um, yeah. You know, and I, I, I say this to people all the time when they, they question these things, and I'm sure you've kind of gone through these things, Pat. You know, you were talking about with Rosa Lopez. Show me, yeah. um, you know, making a cup of tea. I tell people when you yeah. get off when when you get off work today, time. You know, put just hit the timer on your phone. How long does it take you to get from your house, you know, or from work? to your house or from the train yeah. to your house. Okay, now yeah. now change your clothes, take a shower, make yeah. a salad, do all of that. Tell me you do that in, you know, whatever, 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then walk to the distance right. to Nicole's. It's it's illogical. Um yeah. 
a couple things, Pat, I wanted to throw at you that um, uh, these actually come, of course, from Brian, who is is so diligent with these things. And I was just curious if you if you you'd ever heard of these or seen these. But I know there's some debate. You know, the prosecution was never clear as to if if Ron really took a shower. You know, they said he just sort of changed. And uh, Brian dug this up. I don't know if, you, if you've seen this before, but Kim Goldman on uh, E, the, you know, E, the, the entertainment channel. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. She said that, quote, as we can gather from the little a bit of evidence that was there, he just probably came home, jumped in the shower, changed and took off. So I guess this is Kim and Fred when, uh, you know, they went to, to Ron's house afterwards, I, I think, to, to check out or pick up some belongings uh-huh. or things like that. So perhaps they saw a wet towel. So he did take a shower. You know, there's no yeah. there's no way around right. that. And here's another right. interesting thing. Um, he's the car that Ron drives is Andrea Scott's, yeah. who's a friend of his. And, yeah. and she stated in the the Bill Deere documentary, you know, and I don't really believe anything Bill Deere has to say. No, but in no. the you know, yeah, that's another episode. Not in the it. Bill yeah. Deere um, documentary, Andrea Scott states that Ron was dog sitting for her. Did you know this? Yeah. Well, I okay. You know, I, I did this interview with Andrea, but I didn't really get that detail. I either didn't ask her, or didn't remember it, or all I got from mm. her was that Golden borrowed her car. You know. So he, did, he didn't really mm. walk in the coals. He drove Andrea's car in the coals from his apartment on, uh, I forget where he was living, on Montana or somewhere like that. Uh, so mm. he drove that because he needed a vehicle to go to Baja Cantina. So he probably, you know, Trey, I'll, I'll take your dog out and, uh, um, you know, I'll borrow your car. I'll take good care of your car and I'll take good care of your dog. So you don't just, I'm sure you don't just open the door, a dog goes out while you're showering. That's a separate probably a separate event, okay, in that in that short period of time. If you take the dog out, you're not going to just let the dog out, go shit, shower, and shave, and then the dog will be at the door when you're done to come back in. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think you take the dog on a leash, at least around the corner, to do its business and bring it back in. That could be a short period of time, like Rosa. It could be a minute. It could be 30 seconds. The dog could be dying to get outside, run it out there, pee. You're maybe taking your first layer of that that's a Luna clothes off. You go in there and and jump in the shower, but still, it's, it's another logic thing. Logic tells you, yeah. Logic tells you he's not rushing. Okay, he's not in any rush to get to Nicole's house. Number one, to give her a pair of glasses. Now there was all sorts of talk about she had a you know the bathtub with candles lit and all that sort of stuff. Was there going to be this rendezvous because uh, they, there was talk that he and he and uh, he and Nicole were you know, maybe thinking about having an affair, whatever. So even there, even if you give him that kind of line of gossip, that Ron Golden was going over there to be Nicole's, he's not taking a quick shower, okay? He's going to... Exactly, that's even like, more, well, exactly. That, that just leads you to think he's really preparing that. himself. Yeah, exactly. So you're not going to, even though you know her, it's, it's, you're not going to show up like half-dressed like a bum. You're going, you're going out for the evening, and who knows, maybe he was going to say, hey, can you get a sitter? Come out with us. We're going to have fun tonight. I don't know. I don't know what, mm-hmm. what their relationship was. I really don't. Um, it was all speculation. So we had no one to tell us that Nicole and, and, uh, and uh, Goldman had any sort of romantic relationship or anything. I think maybe in one of the, those dumb bitches that wrote books, uh, the Resnick, she might have said something in one of those two silly books she wrote, who, mm. by the way, she, she's probably written more books than she's fucking read. Um, <laughs> but but uh, I think she might have said something like that. But e- even if that's true, then you have a, then you have to reason that this dude got really cleaned up, okay? He, he took a nice shower, he fixed his hair and the, whatever you do out there, and mo- it looks like he moosed it or something, you know? Like mm-hmm. the kids in LA did at the time, that, that kind of look. And, you know, that, you don't just come out of a wet shower and comb your hair back. I think you maybe put mousse or whatever they were doing. So it's, if you go second by every event, brush your teeth, mousse your hair, comb your hair, shower, change clothes, all, all that stuff. Takes Pick time. out your clothes. This is not a guy who's yeah. just uh, throwing something yeah. on either. Come on. Right. Right. He's not throwing coveralls over his Metzaluna outfit. 
It's going to get that far, that smelly thing far away from, I don't mean really, really smelly, but it probably smells like food. It smells like restaurants. Anybody out there that's ever worked in a restaurant or a bar knows that when they get home, those clothes are going to have the smell of where they just spent the last, whatever, four, six, eight hours, ten hours, whatever your shift is, you're going to kind of bring home the smells of that restaurant. You know, if it's a fried food place or the, I don't care if it's a salad place, there's going to be, um, you know, smells associated with that outfit. Now, even if mm. you work all day long in an office, you come home, you're going to change. You're not going to wear the same suit and tie and shirt the next morning. You're going to throw that in the hamper and get it. Maybe you wear the same suit coat, but you're going to change shirts and, you know, yeah. you're not going to, it just, it just logically tells you that he had to have a, a sequence of events that take the time that don't allow him to be at Rockingham at 10.15. And mm. that blows the <laughs> whole timeline away. No, absolutely. And e- even if we, if we, if we think of Ron uh, as some sort of, you know, uh, you know, I was talking about this with Brian last night and, you know, he said, you know, even if you go by the prosecution's idea that he's Superman who, who, when he gets home, it's like he's going into a phone booth and changing his clothes, you know, if he yeah. just comes home, changes his clothes, boom, gets in the car. I mean, that's still like 15 minutes, you know, yeah. I, I mean, for yeah. him to do all those things, you know, exactly. Just he's taking a one minute shower, one minute to dry off. He eats, makes a salad right. in one minute, eats the salad in one minute, puts on the clothes. Right. I mean, wh- what would, what is he doing with the dog? Uh, who knows? But for even right. if you forget the dog, all those things, he's getting. Oh, you know, he's not leaving the house until ten fifteen, which is completely right. unrealistic. Right. Um, and and I, something that. Oh no! Go ahead, Pat. What are you saying? I was going to say I think he left his house later than ten fifteen. Uh, I bet he left it. Closer to 1030, you know, if you think about it. Oh, absolutely. It. No, no. I mean, when I, I was going yeah. through Brian's timeline the other day and, uh, and, and you know, and, I, you know, what I, was, I was also think, thinking about the last time we talked, if because uh, Goldman doesn't he doesn't park on, uh, he, you know, he drives to 875 South Bundy, but he doesn't park there. He parks on Dorothy. OK, Dorothy. now, yeah. if he's again, if he's getting there around. 1015 or I guess a little bit before that, right? Because 1015 yeah. is when the dogs are wailing. So he's got to get there at, I don't know, 1010. I mean, this yeah. is almost exactly the same time that Tom Lang is turning the corner on Dorothy. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, you know, so, so again, either like, again, if, unless Tom Lang is a liar, he's either seeing people that were involved in the murders. Yep. Uh, who saw the, you know, or he saw the murderers or people that knew yep. the murderers and he's just merely, you know, he just nearly missing them and nearly missing Ron Goldman. Again, right. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's so illogical. So, I mean, yeah, I, I was, I mean, in my head, I, I thought Goldman might have even left even later, you know, 1040 uh-huh. or something like that. Yeah. But, yeah. um, if let's say he does leave at, at around, sometime around 1030, uh, it's about a, you know, f- five minute drive over to Nicole's. Uh, yep. let's say a minute or two for parking. So yep. by the time he, uh, and this is a little bit speculative, uh, Pat, but let's say right. he, you know, he, he arrives at, he's ringing Nicole's doorbell at some time around 1035, 1036, 1037, something like that. Yeah. Um, in my mind, you know, uh, I'm thinking he's ringing the doorbell, doors open, you know, Nicole opens the gate because it's broken. She can't buzz him in, so they're both down yeah. in that area. Uh, yeah. And I guess, you know, she opens the door, and then these the two murderers, whoever they are, rush yeah. them, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, what do you think happened? That's my idea, but what do you think? Well, I think that's exactly what happened. Now, where the murderers were or why they were going to murder Nicole, I believe, was the target. Um, there's circumstantial evidence out there that could make a Goldman a target, but I don't think that night he was a target. So I think mm-hmm. that it would make sense the way Nicole was found and cut from behind that perhaps one of the guys was up by the door, and when she comes down to open the gate, you know, he gets her as, as he's – and Goldman's going, hey, 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 and then he and the other guy, because I think – Nicole was killed instantly and dropped to the ground with the, the wounds she had. She just dropped. Uh, she mm. didn't scream anything. They just, you know, almost decapitated her. And then I think Goldman fights for his life with one or two people. And, 
you know, he's got wounds consistent with, uh, on his knuckles, consistent with putting up a struggle. And I think the prosecutor tried to say he swung and missed and hit the tree. And that's why OJ doesn't have any, uh, you know, yeah. uh, hematomas or anything like that on his body when he's completely photographed top to bottom by Henry Lee and Michael Bodden. Um, they just pounded square holes, squares into round holes the entire trial. And I, I remember sitting there thinking, I mean, I would almost mock every day in court and come back and say, well, that's a load of shit. Here's why. Bop, bop, bop. And, you know, we would sit around and, you know, watch our case develop and go, these guys, I mean, I think I remember saying that either Marsha or Darden, when there was a break one time, there's nobody in the court. I said, who in your office thinks up this theory that O.J. Simpson puts on a knit cap, gets in his own car, <laughs> drives over and murders two people, and the reason he's got, what's the story about the shovel and the bag in the back of the car that Mark Furman made such a big uh, uh, thing about in the prelim? Oh, was that nefarious or what? Oh, he had a shovel and a plastic bag in the trunk. Oh, okay, what was he going to do? Kill two people, put them in that bag, and then bury them? It's never to be seen again, and no one would ask questions? I mean, I used to say, mm. come on, who thinks of these theories? Come on now. And it would just be a few, McKenna. You know, like, you know, mm. you mock everything. I go, yeah, I do. I mock every bit of this case, you know? I mock this prosecution because you're, you're not looking for the truth. You're looking to nail O.J. Simpson. You got people in your own office that question some of this, and you shout them down. You know. And also, I mean, you, you've, you've got when these uh, murders are taking place, uh, and again, I, I'm you know I lean much more towards the ten thirty six, ten forty range um, yeah. because again, too, Denise Pilnack is very specific that it was a quiet night. Um, and yeah. she even, I think, remarks with her friend, it was eerily quiet, um, yes. you know, in the neighborhood. And then around this 1034, 1036, the, the dog starts, she, she starts to hear a dog barking, and that goes on for like 30 minutes. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, again, this is the plaintive wail of a dog. Um, yeah. So, you know, we, we've, we've got at least somewhere, you know, I think it's, it's, um, you know, Henry Lee, Dr. Henry Lee, Dr. Michael Baden, both testified yep. that this was a prolonged struggle, that this wasn't yeah. like, you know, OJ's not slitting throats and, you know, in a minute or two, they're dead. Right. Um, right. This is going on maybe 10, 15 minutes. Um, well, that's what I was going to say about Goldman when I was talking about his knuckles. I forgot to mention about the blood, uh, on his jeans. And the, the uh, whatever you would call it, the downward stain of this blood tells you that he was standing and fighting. Uh, blood doesn't mm. run, you know, blood runs downhill, doesn't run uphill. So he's still mm. standing, fighting for his life, uh, you know, and getting stuck here and stuck there and grabbed and whatever, you know, stabbed in the neck and in the back and all over by more than one person. He's fighting for his life. He mm-hmm. didn't just stand there, drop his hands and say, oh, am I next? Go ahead, take me. <laughs> no, he he fought mm-hmm. for his life. He said, hey, you know, I'm thinking he's the one with the hey, hey, hey. And, and uh, it, then it's quiet. And next thing you hear is two men uh, arguing after the gate slams. So there are, the murderers are already out the back. And, uh, they're, now they're arguing. I, and I don't know if they're arguing. They might say, who the fuck was that guy? What's he doing here? Who's, who's the guy who right. had to kill? You know, maybe they were going for Nicole, and now this new guy shows up, so they're probably just as freaked as anybody. Mm. So, um, and again, then, yeah. then you know, even being generous with all of this, by the time the murders are supposed to be done, OJ's bumping Cato's air conditioner. Exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. I, I mean, it, it's Dropping so illogical. Yeah, he's got to be in. Uh, yeah, I mean, he he just could not be. He could not have done that. Um, right. You know, in in either timeline. Right. Um, I mean, yeah. Okay. I mean, I I know. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people were kind of you know taking a dead horse here, but people yeah. really should focus on these timelines, especially Ron Goldman's, because just logically, even if you want to, you know, and again, Brian doesn't. You know, he goes into this. Uh, obviously, he has his opinions, and yeah. so do we. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you you yeah. have to try to go into these things 
um, completely blank. You know, you're not trying to yeah. <laughs> nitpick or, or figure things out or let your bias come in here. Just go by logically. Goldman gets home. He takes a shower. He makes a salad. Yeah. He gets ready yeah. to go out. You know, he eats a salad. All of these things. He possibly walks the dog. Think yep. about it. You know, how yeah. long would that really take? Right. Uh, I mean, it's crazy. Um, well, Pat, um, uh, you know, let, let's get to some some listener questions because we got we got okay. quite a few. Um, I don't know. If, you know, we we we'll probably have to continue this uh, later All on. Right. Uh, and of course, I mean, there's more we could get into with the timeline and stuff. But I think we'll kind of leave that sure. there because there's a lot of okay. stuff to process there. Um, okay. But uh, well, I get you. You sort of answered this earlier, but the you know I got a bunch of questions saying you know was Nicole the intended target, um, or was Ron the the intended target, or was was it the both of them? Um, it does seem uh, like Ron might have been collateral damage, um, but but perhaps not. But any any sort of insight into that? Well. You know, we kicked this around because early in the case, we knew that Ron Goldman had a good friend, I think his name was Brent Cantor, who had yeah. been murdered before Ron did, and he was slashed ear to ear in his own home with no sign of forced entry, nothing taken, it wasn't a robbery, it was a pure murder, okay? We heard, but never verified, that Cantor and Goldman were somehow involved in promoting clubs downtown. I mean, even if they're doing that, does it make sense that Goldman is a target by some club guy that he's uh, promoting instead of somebody else? So, and there was also Michael Nigg who got killed after Goldman. So there's a little nexus there as an investigator. You go, holy cow, here's three people that know each other, all murdered within a short period of time. Um, with some In the same way. Yeah, not robberies, not anything. They're just flat-out murders. So that would make you kind of start thinking – but then when you think that way, you go, well, if, if Goldman's a target, they don't know he's going in the Cole's house. So they'd have to be, you know, surveilling him and all that. So then if you believe that, then you have to realize that the people Tom Lang saw would have been friendly with the Cole and would have come forward by now. That was me in the white Ford. We were, I've been chasing forever. She rebuffed me or whatever Tom Lang saw. Mm. You'd have to say, who are those people now? I always thought those were the bad people. Because that's the first question I get usually when I uh, give, a, mm. give a speech or talk to a group of people. It's like, well, if O.J. didn't do it, who did it? That's always like, mm. well, the people at Tom Lang seem to be the ones that must have done it because they didn't come forward as friends. Every other person on the planet came. Chris Jenner came forward like every other day to say she was her best friend. And then we <laughs> knew better. So, you know. Uh, these people, had they been friendly, they would have come forward and said, hey, that's me. I'm in the, I'm the little guy in the angry stance. I thought Tom Lang's dog was going to jump. And, you know, we were going over there, drop some, well, they wouldn't go over, they would never testify we went to Nicole's to get some dope or give her some dope or whatever. Uh, I don't think that would have been why. Um, and so I, it's always been kind of my, even though I've kicked it around back and forth, it's my opinion that <clears throat> Nicole was the target. And Goldman happened onto the scene and then was taken out by these guys. Mm. So then you have to ask, why would someone kill Nicole? Why would someone do it? So usually the husband's the first suspect in a murder, so they went after the husband. But here you had so much evidence that her group of friends that she was running around with, like Faye Resnick and those kind of folks, had been running, doing cocaine, doing the wildlife and all that sort of stuff. Uh trading sex with partners. I mean, there could be jealousy about that. You know, maybe she rebuffed some guy that was coming for to be, maybe the guy in the truck was going to be the guy in the bathtub with the candles. And she said, no, mm. I'm not doing it now. I, you know, who knows? I don't know, but I think, uh, um, she was the target and Goldman was just dispatched as he unfortunately came on the scene and fought valiantly for his life. Um, mm. but I kind of think it's, there and then like you say if the cold why would someone kill a mother of two children and you have and oj always told us look in phase world look in phase world that's where you're going to find mm-hmm. you did this. so you know mm-hmm. we didn't get much cooperation well I remember- I, no no i doubt it right yeah no, again too i mean you know you you've got i mean faye resnick and nicole freebasing non-stop this becomes right. expensive 
You know, and they're not yeah. smoking crack. They're smoking base, which is a lot more expensive. Uh, and yeah. they're, you know, again, you have to think logically, think like a, a detective. If you're using this much coke all the time, eventually you're going to get to the issue of how do I afford this? And then it yeah. becomes, well, why don't you sell it? Why don't you move it? Why don't you, you know, uh, help us out with something? And right. what, you know, right. it, 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 there's so many possibilities for things to go wrong in that sort of a scenario. Yeah. And then, of course, yeah. where's Faye Resnick? She's safe, you know, off in uh, rehab, uh, coming she's off of the, coke. Yeah. She's in um, rehab, inpatient, yeah, coming off of coke. Yeah. And then there's the aspect right. that I always thought, um, after, they're, after they get Nicole into rehab, does this little group of friends say, you know, we're out of this? Like you say, we're not, we're mm. going to, we're stopping. We're not. We're going to turn the guys in that are doing this to our friend. Look at her. She's in the hospital. We got whoever face friend that's been bringing all this. We're going to give them up to the cops. I don't know. I don't know who those folks that showed up at ten o'clock. But it could be any of those kinds of scenarios. You know. Listen, we're done. We're not doing it anymore. We're not paying you anymore. We're not buying any. We're not selling any. As a matter of fact, get away from us. Yeah. And we're going to turn you to the cops. Well, that will make. A drug dealer could be looking at a mandatory minimum, who knows what, 10, 20 life to act a little violently or viciously or retaliate in some way. I don't know. We'll, maybe mm -hmm. we'll never know. But, but well, uh, and they could have, they could have driven off, you know, thought about it. Oh no, fuck that. Let's, you know, yeah. let her know what's well, up. They, we, they drive yeah, back. Ron is there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, and I, you know, I think too the the stuff with um, I, I'm still fascinated by Brett Cantor and Michael Nig. You know, not to mention that there's a bunch of OJ's associates who are also killed just before yeah. and just after the murders down in Florida and, and stuff. And I I do wonder if there's a larger connection there, or if this isn't just indicative of the the sort of company that they all kept. You know, that they were yeah. running in these sorts of circles. And, you know, I, I'm sure you've seen this as a private investigator. You know, when you're looking into yeah. people in, involved in drugs or prostitution or, or just, a, you know, criminal underworld, yeah, criminal a lot of your friends are going to get killed. You know, that's not, yeah, that's not uncommon. Uh, another, another question that, um, uh, I, I got from a, a couple listeners and is one that I'm also particularly fascinated with. And I've always wanted to, to get a little get a little bit more is uh, Dr. Jennifer Amelia, yeah, who was the psychiatrist for yeah. both uh, Nicole and Ron, uh, suffered yeah. a series of, of break ins and harassment. Um, you know, she I, I believe at one point said that I mean, aside from her, uh, I believe it was in Malibu is where her office were was broken in uh, uh, several times. Case file. I mean, I believe at least Ron's case file was stolen. Uh, she had anonymous callers asking to purchase files on, on Nicole and Ron. And at one point said that she would, you know, uh, someone put a gun to the back of her head. Um, yeah. you know, cars cutting her off. What, what do you make of this? Um, I mean, obviously there's, there's something to that. Um, uh, you know, it's not just, that's not a coincidence. Right. And, and, uh, so we did know a lot about that stuff. Here's the thing I got to say when you do criminal defense. You're defending a person who, for example, he didn't do it. It's not my job to now go and do the cop's job and find out if he didn't do it, who did it. So we kind of right. looked at that, but it's not something we follow up with too much because she wasn't cooperating with us, with us obviously. She did talk to the police. And so, you know, it's really fluid and fast when you're when you're doing a murder case. And, um, you know, our, we were building, I kept working on timeline, the demeanor, and that Mark Furman, you know, because that's, you know, it was our opinion that the evidence showed that Mark Furman ha was the kind of guy that could frame somebody. And, and in this case, did a hell of a job framing somebody, except, you know, it was very flawed in what he did, but no one challenged him on it except us. None of his buddies did. As a matter of fact, they they embraced him and surrounded him and fought for him all the way through the case until the tapes were, were recovered. Even when he testified that I never used the N-word in March, there's a picture that um, 
um, Roger uh, Sandler from Life Magazine, or yeah, Life Magazine, who was covering the case at the time. Uh, he has some phenomenal photographs. As a matter of fact, he was in O.J.'s house when O.J. surrenders, and this guy with an M16. He has really powerful photographs. I've seen a lot of them. I said to him, this is the most powerful photograph. It's right after Furman's testifying. They're all in the office, and Furman's, like, show, he's, like, got a smirk on his face, and he's got Lang and Van Adder on each side of him, almost look at him like, you done good, kid, you know? Mm. And w- when I say that to Roger, I said, look at his picture. Mark Furman knows, or at least he thinks, he got away with it, but in no way is he, this picture doesn't show him, uh, like, cocky or anything like he was in court. It's almost like, ooh, ooh, I'm a, I did get away with his shoulders shrugged a little bit, and a, 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 mm. a goofy, smirky grin. Uh, that's just my opinion. I mean, because that's, I believe he did what he did, and, you know, some of those pictures to me are kind of powerful that, that, uh, you know, he got away. He, he thought he got away with everything, and then the hmm. tapes come out. And you don't see any. You don't see any warm and fuzzy pictures with Martians and Van Adder and all these guys after those tapes surfaced. So they no. went along. They went along with it that he wouldn't, couldn't possibly have planted a glove, and he didn't use the N word. And we've interviewed him, and his best friends are black. And this prosecutor, who's black, said he's a good guy. He couldn't possibly do this. Then you look at his records. You look at his psychological records, his pension, where he's trying to catch a pension, his own sworn testimony, uh, using the N-word and all this stuff. And, of course, that was prior to 10 years. So we knew he would try to say, oh, I did it, but then I got better. That's why you, you notice Bailey asked about the, in the past 10 years, making it 84. Yes. So, so that cut him from saying, well, I was that kind of a bad boy, uh, but – but I didn't do it ever again. So that hmm. was kind of a strategic move by Lee, which was, I thought, brilliant. Uh, because he, we knew that Furman's kind of uh, psychiatry, if you will, his ego would say, these dumb bastards are forgetting that I said this in my pension in 83 or 82 or whatever it is. Now they give me 10 years. So all that shit's before that. So I can sit here and say, no, I didn't do that. I didn't hmm. do that. <laughs> And then you see Lee, because we went through all the, you know, we have all these binders and we had all these records and all that. And, and, and God bless Lee Bailey, you know, he says, ah, we're going to do it ten, in the last 10 years. And so he, Bailey, trapped this guy in that, uh, in my mind, hell, I said this way back when, but he's given me this 10 year period. I got to, no one's going to come forward then. I, you know, I, I mean, he's that crazy of an ego. He's on tape. He doesn't real. He doesn't think they're going to come out these tapes, you know. I think that. Boy, he's I, bragging I, on these tapes, even you know when he's testifying, saying I never used the M word. I got yeah, and and I found the glove. I'm in the biggest yeah. case of the century without the. He's taping, but see his his guy Pelicano, who's now in federal prison, attempted with one of his people or somebody to get the Laura Hart McKinney to destroy the tapes. I think either in one of his book or some testimony or something that they tried to, to get the tapes and get Laura to destroy them. Cause they knew they were out there, you know, so Pelicano, can you talk about that a little bit, Pat, the Anthony yeah. Pelicano? I know he, he, he yeah. pops up uh, throughout this case and he is one of these sort yep. of amazing characters. Um, yep. But what, did you have any experience with Pelicano? what did you find out yeah. about Pelicano? Well, first of all, uh, Pelicano got my name years earlier. I think he was representing uh, Steven Seagal. And there was right. a, a fellow that wrote a nasty article about Seagal in Spy Magazine or something, if my re- recollection is correct. And they wanted me, there was some sort of a hearing or case or something in Atlanta, so across the country. So he got my name from somebody and he called me and. Uh, and I said, yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll go get it. And I happened to be sitting at a bar with John McNally, who was an investigator within our case, the former New York cop. And I said, what? And he's going, I own this town. You come to L.A., everything's on me. He's doing all this shit. <laughs> talk. I go, look, I didn't know him from Adam. I go, hey, listen, you hire me. Here's what I charge. I'll go get that. I'll get I'll go. And then the court file, and I'll send you the transcripts or depots or whatever you need. I didn't know much about it. But then when we get out there, uh, actually, John McNally and myself went to his office, 
and uh, you know, he's uh, one of these. Uh, let's go do a walk and talk. You know, this mob kind of talk. You know, yeah, yeah. Hey, let's go. <laughs> let's go do a walk and talk. It's like a walk and talk. We just came to your office to see. You know, you. We hear you're working for Turtolo, and what do you got? You know, Furman and blah blah blah. And I remember he kept saying, "Come on, guys, did the nigger do it?" He must have used the N-word 50 times, hoping we would, I guess, say something and then be on tape that would be able to produce because we now know that he taped everybody and everything and uh, broke into people's places and wiretapped them illegally. You know, that's why he's sitting in a federal penitentiary. Um, but he popped in and out. All of a sudden, he's holding a press conference, okay, that some witness is saying that Anthony Pelicano had a video of – Two private investigators, I guess that meant me and McNally, from the East Coast surveilling Nicole or some craziness, right? It was just a bullshit story. But he makes it into something about himself and has a big press conference. Oh, I don't know these investigators. I didn't hire anybody. To, you know, I know. I forget what he was saying. So he pops in there. Then we find out, you know, he's working for Furman. So they use like an outside contractor to try to destroy these tapes that they knew existed. Now, he'll never admit to that, but we now know that's what happened because Mark Furman's not going to go to his lieutenant and say, hey, you need to get a hold of this fraud out in North Carolina because <laughs> I really fucked up on tape and I'd like somebody to get a somebody out there to get her to destroy these tapes or arrest her for something or frame her or something. No, he's got to use a dirty guy like Pelicano who they probably worked together in the past. They're, they're birds of a feather. They were corrupt and uh, racist, and they probably had a good uh, a good time together. But um, i trying to think of when I else I saw him in that case, because when we left, I remember looking at John. I said, do you believe what this guy is? Do you believe this guy? And John just laughed. You know, I said, and we were laughing. John goes, walk and talk. That's like out of the God talk. We're going to do a walk and talk, you know? That's John Gotti mm. stuff. Let's walk and talk. Walk and talk. Oh, because cause there might be a bug in here? So, mm. anyways, he, he was just a weird, weird bird. He was out there defending Furman all the way through. And, and uh, you know, I never heard from him after that. Really, I didn't hear much from him in that case because uh, we kind of ignored him. He was a self-promoting blowhard and, uh, uh, you know. He probably well, and, was involved. You know, his whole world came crashing down around him, too. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, see, I was on – Furman was my witness, right? So there were so many times that there would be a, quote, a tip that I should go meet this guy who has information. So I would follow all these tips and leads. I remember being in some – on the second story of some bar on the second floor in a pool room at 2.30 in the morning – because my buddy that was out there, Howard Harris, he used to freak out and go, you can't, you're going out now? I go, well, this guy says he's got information on Furman, you know? So I go, and this guy's all tatted up, big gangster looking dude. And he's telling me, I got information that Mark, I mean, that, uh, Marsha Clark and Chris Darden are, uh, having an affair. I go, well, I don't give a shit about that. I thought you had information <laughs> about Mark Furman, you know? So it was kind of like, waste my time. At two in the morning, I, I drove out to, I think it was called Woodland Hills. It was a long drive from where I was, a good half hour, 40 minutes, meet this guy in a, in the upstairs of a pool hall to, to give me a load of shit. And so there were so many of those things, uh, that I bet that he was involved with because he's that kind of a guy to plant fake stuff and make you chase it and all that ruin your time. But like I said earlier, I, I have one case on my plate that time. So I have 20 hours a day to work if I want. And, you know, I was really obsessed and, and, you know, following everything and, and reading everything and chasing down leads for three things, the timeline, the demeanor and the, um, and Mark Furman, you know, I didn't have to deal with DNA. Barry Sheck and Peter Newfeld dealt with that. The only thing I did with DNA was go get the records and bring them down and kind of look with them. And I kind of be fascinated at how they went through this stuff, but, but, uh, you know, my, well, my, wait, the, even there, Pat. Um, two, well, two things. One, uh, I I do want to say, and I have to double check that I, I might have it somewhere in my notes that the Furman and Pelicano do go way back, like to the eighties, that they knew a bunch. Oh, you know, uh, I, I think it's um, what's his name, uh, Hollywood producer 
who uh, died of like a big overdose. Um, famous I, Don Simpson, I, I think. Oh, and, Don you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And Pelicano used to protect him. Um, you know, yeah. back in the day, and I think the, you know, the first cop that appeared on the scene at Don Simpson when he died was Furman, something like that. Um, but Furman, I mean, uh, it, rather, Pelicano was for sure during the trial working for Furman. You, you, you're pretty confident oh, yeah. in that? As, oh, absolutely. He told us he was. Yeah, oh, okay. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he was working for Turtolo. I think Turtolo even had told us that too. Turtolo, remember that guy? He was the lawyer for, um, Furman at the beginning. I, I think yes. he kind of got put out to pasture towards the end of the case because he was in way over his head. Uh, nice fella. <laughs> we met him. We met him out in Brentwood one time, him and his wife, and we were early in the case, and he's a nice fella, and we were talking to him, who we were, introduced ourselves, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but then he, you know, he, he went, fell by the wayside. I think Furman got somebody else mm-hmm. or else just fired him or something. Or maybe Turtle was there in name only all the way to the end. I don't know, but he certainly mm. wasn't standing next to him when Furman took the Fifth Amendment six or ten <laughs> times or whatever it was when we brought him back in. You know, mm. so it wasn't him then. It was the police union lawyer that was standing there next to him then. Um, and uh, I got another thing. And I mean, now, of course, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to have you back on just maybe just for a Furman episode. But um, OK, any did you dig up anything? Uh, and again, we don't have too much time, but did you dig up anything okay. specifically on Furman and Nicole's relationship and the rumors that they were more than just friends? And maybe, you know, uh, there's the rumors that he was her cop on the force. But, you know, then we've got the boob job comment. Uh, yeah. You know, anything did you, did you dig up anything on that? We never did. We just thought, had heard those rumors, but there was nothing to document any of it because we didn't have any of it. You know, it was in tabloids. It was all sorts of stuff like that, but we couldn't find a, a, anything. Uh, Furman might have said something in one of his police reports or something about Nicole. Because remember, they had that relationship when he came to the house in 80, whatever it was, 83, when the, with the Mercedes. And 84, the I think. 84, yeah. Furman sitting on the... I mean, uh, OJ's sitting on the hood of the Mercedes, and she's screaming at him. He's banging the the hood of the mm-hmm. car, and uh, you know, uh, Furman said something to him. He says, "I paid for this car. I can bang this car." I think he gave it extra little. He was just tapping the hood, you know. But of yeah. course, the story gets out that he smashed the windshield while she's behind the driver's seat. This crazy story, when in fact it wasn't any of that, because Furman would have probably shot him on sight if he's wailing away on a smashed yeah. windshield. But <laughs> But, you know, um, but well, we only heard rumors, just the rumors, uh, never anything. There was never a person that would come forward that we could say, hey, you need to go talk to so-and-so because he inf- has information, Nicole. Like, even none of Nicole's friends that were close mm-hmm. with us, like Cora Fishman and a couple others, you know, they didn't, they said that's BS. So I, I don't know. Um, like I said, we were running down enough crazy stuff that, and we had enough stuff on Furman that, that, uh, you know, you didn't it would have been gold. It. Yeah, it would have been gold if there was something like that, but that was, uh, just too, too, too deep a water to fish in, you know? Mm-hmm. Just could, you know, at for me, so. Well, and I've got, uh, this one is, is sort of, uh, this one's a personal, uh, question of mine. Uh, okay. and, uh, you know, and this is, you know, this will, this will bring us kind of full circle and some current events. But, um, uh, Pat, you live, uh, you live down in, in Palm Beach, uh, very near to, uh, Mar-a-Lago, the, you know, the second White House. And I know that I think it's in Faye Resnick's book. I think it's the first one that she wrote on this. Uh, she talks about a time when they were all up in Aspen together and Donald Trump was uh was was hanging out with them. Do you have any any anything on uh, Donald Trump's connections to OJ or or, or you know it, again tangential I, I would assume at best, but anything like that going on because I'm I'm pretty sure they knew each other. Uh but do you have anything? No, we never did, but I think I think OJ and Trump had met probably on a golf course down here or something like that. Not nothing to do. I don't think OJ was ever at Mar-a-Lago and if he was it was before Trump owned it. Mm. Uh, but you know, the, if Trump used to come down here, and of course OJ golfed up there too, so it would make sense 
um, you know, OJ would work for NBC for a long time. It would make sense that they would be acquaintances, but I don't know. We never had anything that they hung together in Aspen or anything like that. Um, uh, yeah, I think you know, it, I think it's in in Faye Resnick's book. She talks about the this time they're all up in Aspen together, and Donald Trump was obsessed at the time they were there with some big breasted bimbo. I think as she as she, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, you know, and uh, I mean, Pat, do you have any experience with Donald Trump? I know you're you're very close to Mar-a-Lago. Have you ever met him before, or or had any sort of no. dealings with him? No, never. Uh, okay, so, so lucky in that regard. Very lucky, yeah. Well, and I get, you know, we, we still have a, a, a few minutes here, Pat, um, and, okay. uh, you know, maybe not enough for, for any questions and stuff, but, um, is, is there anything, anything you'd like to leave the listeners with or, uh, anything that you're working on right now, uh, that you'd, you'd like the listeners to know about, uh, anything like that? Uh, well, I wouldn't probably want to discuss what I'm working on because it's all privilege and stuff like that. And, and uh, um, but I'd like them to look at if they have the time. I mean, if they're, if they're obviously in our crowd here that are pro OJ, it's really examine the preliminary he- hearing. Cause I'm doing that with Brian and, and I want to go back to it. I talked to, you know, Lee and I have done some work on this. We were writing a book. We haven't finished it yet, but um, you look at the preliminary hearing and what everybody was feeling, how, how horrible this was looking for O.J. Simpson, and then you see all the how that most of that bullshit just melted away into nowhere, and never came back during the trial. Like I say, the two knives, Gold, Doctor Golden, he never came back. The knife from Ross Cutlery, they abandoned that real quick. Oh, it was real big, red hot, no shit detective work. And Banana went down to Ross Cutlery and brought all these the tray of knives to Doctor Gold. Uh, golden to see which knives could have caused these two wounds blah 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 and then unfortunately for us because we had oj says to henry lee and the lawyers that i bought a knife there it should be sitting on my dresser in its original Mm -hmm. case which it was henry lee and then what they called out there at the time a special master so it's a judge or and the prosecutor that had nothing to do with the Simpson case, and I can't imagine that prosecutor, there wasn't a lawyer in that office that didn't want to weigh in on Simpson prosecution, but they went out there and examined the knife. It was in pristine condition. They put it in the sealed envelope, brought it to the court, and of course the the, the judge, the, I forget her name, Kathleen Powell or something like that, wore, wore, wore the big pop beads, colorful pop beads over her robe. She held it up. Uh, I have this, and, and that kind of took the wind out of our sails because we're going to let, let them commit to make that another thing they did, that O.J. bought the murder weapon, you know. Mm, we said, mm-hmm. well, here, here's the knife. So that judge kind of screwed us in that she took the wind out of that punch we were going to throw at them when they they were uh, strutting around like sanctimonious peacocks during the preliminary hearing, you know, and the the, uh, the shovel and the plastic bag and the Bronco and uh a six foot, two hundred twenty five pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was seen going. Ah, oh, where'd you get that off? One of the football cards? For God, I've never heard anything go mm. six foot, two twenty five. I've heard, you know, six foot, two hundred, six foot, two fifty. I never got it right down to his playing weight, you know, or whatever mm-hmm. his weighing is. But even you know, though and, um, and Park is so far away, how the hell could he even see it? though? you know what I mean? Yeah, I think Park was smoking reef for that night, you know, because he. He didn't even get on the 405. He got on uh, Sepulveda, which drove down at parallel 95. So I think he missed his turn even. OJ thought he was high because he was babbling and all that mm. sort of stuff. But I, I never could prove any of that stuff. We couldn't prove that. But, but, uh, um, I forgot about something I was going to tell you about the prelim. Uh, oh, well, 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 we're at the, uh, we're at the end of the show today, okay. Pat. Thank you. Uh, hey. Thank you so much for for joining us again, and uh, I'm sure we'll have you sure. back on again soon because lots more. Maybe we'll get you and Brian on. But uh, thank all you right. for joining us. Thank you all for listening. Uh, I'll be coming uh, next week with Keelan Balderson. We're going to be doing a update episode on Manchester and all of that. So stay tuned. And until then, I will be talking to you very soon.
facts, news, and information you can trust. This is American Freedom Radio. Freedom, freedom, American Freedom Radio. Radio. American Freedom Radio. And I hope people support American Freedom Radio. And I hope people vote with their dollars and really understand the value of having American Freedom Radio. Because that's my family. If you love me at all, Jack Blood, support American Freedom Radio. Like, my family has literally disowned me. <laughs> American Freedom Radio, Danny and Don and those guys, those are my actual family. So please, please support these guys because they have all the technology. They have all these great things that they're going to do. But obviously, they can't do it all by themselves. So not only would I like to see you support them, I'd like to see you retweet them and repost them and really get involved and get on the, the bandwagon, so to speak, on doing that do-it-yourself promotion because they're a do-it-yourself radio network, and, uh, and, and we just need that so much. Nutritious food is real body armor. It builds muscle, burns fat, improves digestion, and feeds the entire body the nutrients it needs. Did you know the U.S. government banned the hemp plant from growing in the United States and classified it as a Schedule One drug to hide it behind the marijuana plant? People have been confused about this plant for over 80 years, and many still don't know what hemp is. So now you know hemp is not marijuana, and marijuana is not hemp. They are different varieties of the same species. Hemp U.S. USA.org wants the world to know these basic facts and to help people understand that hemp protein powder is the best kept health secret you need to know about. Remember, hemp protein powder contains 53% protein, is gluten-free, anti-inflammatory, non-GMO, and is loaded with nutrients. Call 888-910-4367, 888-910-4367, and see what our powder, seeds, and oil can do for you only at HempUSA.org. We all know that they're not telling us the truth. So stand up for your rights, demand the real medicine, and your right to use it and grow it. This is Rick Sensen, and you're listening to American Freedom Radio. 